Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head, and in this episode, I'm talking to Ian Sudlow Mackay. He's a librarian for the University of Chester. He worked his way up to this after starting as a learning resources assistant. Having been told you should probably focus on more vocational things, he's now actually the holder of three master's degrees, including one for the University of St. Andrews. As always, I'll post links to things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Ian. Hello. Good evening. How are you today? Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Given the joys of technology. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we're recording this slightly later than planned, as uh, unfortunately Ian's local area had a power outage, which is the first time I've had that on a podcast recording. The thing I noticed while reading your profile and doing a bit of research, you seem to have quite a keen interest in history, and quite a lot of your academic studies flow around that. How did that come about? Well, my my joy, well, my parents say my joy of history comes from when I was a two year old. Okay. And there's a photograph of me sat on a horse with a knight in shining armor. <laughs> 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 and that was, I guess, I was about two years old. It was like some sort of event that was being hosted at a, a pub down there. I think it was down in Cornwall at the time. But it, I think it was more solidified when I was about five or six. Um, I, I'm from Ellsmere, from Ellesmere Port. Which is in the northwest. Um, okay. And it's about, it's only about, uh, what do you call it, five or six miles from Chester, which is where I live. And one of my first ever family outings was out with my grandparents to Chester. So we did the fabulous city walls. Um, we did a, a walk around the cathedral and went to all the museums. I think it was just to caught my imagination at that point, just obsessed with the past and various aspects of history and that sort of set me off on that trajectory really so which would you say is your favorite thing to study in history your sort of favorite oh. era? <laughs> yeah that, that's like asking my other half what's his favorite godzilla or what's his favorite dinosaur <laughs> um, <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm, i would say i'm definitely more of a medievalist slash early modernist so Medieval periods, castles, and also going to the Tudors and Stuarts sort of period. They're my sort of many oh, nice. areas. Nice. With a slight mattering for, you know, Romans as well, because, well, Chester was basically a Roman city, so you've got archaeology all over the place for that. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> that's, that's quite cool. And I, I see out of your many, many qualifications that they are mostly history focused. Did you pick various eras as you were going through, or how did you kind of navigate the courses? Yeah, well, with with my courses, um, you've got to be very careful when you start selecting your degree in history, just because you can go onto some courses. When I was when I was evaluating mine, there's a lot of modern political stuff. Um, I was very fortunate when I did my GCSEs. My, my history GCSE was history of medicine, which actually informs something later on. We'll come to. Um, and also Elizabethan England as an in depth topic. And then A levels was what I class as some of the most boring stuff, which is modern twentieth century political history, you know, Nazi Germany, Weimar Republic, Communist Russia. Oh right, yes. And, and it's just not my period. <laughs> no. <laughs> it is history, but it's just not my period. And if you're not careful, you can just fall into degree courses that and that's all it pretty much covers is pretty much modern history. Um and Chester had a good breadth and width in terms of different periods that were covered so you had medievalists early modern and a bit of modern as well so and you were forced to go down the routes of picking something that wasn't that was something outside of your comfort area so you did still have to do little bits but it wasn't focused <laughs> no that's that's cool so before we dive into your university and academic studies i want to bring it back to when you found out you were dyslexic how was that did that come about so um, I was lucky in one respect because I, I was caught in, in primary school. I was about six or seven. Um, I was very, young, very young. Yeah. Um, one of my first school reports said Ian is lazy and hides from work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. yeah. Before, before I'd been diagnosed, but um, talking, um, talking to my parents, I was lucky. My dad was on the board of governors as a oh. parent association sort of rep. Okay, and it was only through getting contact and understanding how the system works that way that they were able to get me assessed and statemented. Because um, at the time there was about 
four or five was that all got sent into at the same time that got picked up because the area that we lived in it's not a sort of economically prosperous area but so there's a bit of a there's a, quite often a, what do we call it, um, a link you normally put um, between dyslexia and the sort of the social economic make up an area as well so <clears throat> um, yeah I was quite quite lucky in that respect that we that my parents were able to sort of navigate the system and get get that assessment done and that, that sort of support put in place Okay, and how was your experience through sort of early schooling with that? Because I, my experience was, yes, I'd found out dyslexic and got the extra time and stuff, but wanting to fit in with class and stuff, I found really hard and going to lessons that I wasn't great at. And it'd be interesting yeah. to see how yours is. Um, primary school, it was a lot of that sort of withdrawal support. So you're taken off in a nice little group of three or four people where you did simpler books and... Sounds very familiar. Uh, they worked on, you know, phonics and spread, uh, what do you call it? Not spreadsheets. That's something much later on. Um, <laughs> activity sheets. Yes. Um, my, my, my parents were really keen on keeping my sort of developing my skills throughout and catching up. So my summer holidays, I was given a rook of those phonic and sort of spelling sheets to work on throughout my summer holidays. So I never actually had a, a full break, if that sort of yes. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that sort of kept me going to a certain extent. It was so I didn't sort of have that six hours, six weeks out, and then all of a sudden being hit again with sort of that school mentality. Um, so I think that's that stood me in good stead as well, in terms of keeping the momentum going. Yes. Did you did you find uh, that that no, you just kept the momentum going, but it allowed you to catch up ever so slightly over the six weeks. So yeah. Long holiday. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, it definitely did, and I think as yeah, it, it's not not every what every student sort of ideal situation, but I think I just took it as if you just did an activity a day, it yeah. kept the little grey cells going, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, now that's really interesting. I, I, had a cut previous guest on that had extra stuff through the holidays and they said it really helped because it's six weeks worth of catching up with everybody else who's not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. And that really helps. Did you find you shifted in secondary school? You had to step up things. It, it was interesting in secondary school um, because when I first started in secondary school, we had three tiers, best way to describe it, of, of students. Yes. <laughs> so you had target which was basically your top set improver which was your middle and then you had core Ooh. which was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. language um that was for you students who were statemented so because i went up transferred from primary school to high school i was automatically put into the core class with all the other statement kids and and we hit around about i think it was around about easter i remember having like a, a meeting with my form tutor and the other tutors in the school, sort of wearing prompt your parental, and they said, Well, it's clear Ian's got IQ. It's just a dyslexia that's held, holding him back a little bit. So at that point, they moved me into a, a higher class, and I was given withdrawal support from that point onwards. So um, after my first year, years eight, nine, I was in top set target class. There were some things where I did lack behind. Maths, mental maths was a no-go. I mean, like, no, my, uh, my maths teacher just accepted when it comes to parents' evenings, Ian's not going to get the 20 out of 20 on the mental arithmetic tests because it's just not my call type at all. Well, I hate testing because I'm just going to stop. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we were able to be more streamed and it got to, like, GCSE, so I was put into a foundation pa paper for English, but I still managed to get a C. It was only the only grade I could get, but it was... YFG. So, yeah, so it was an interesting experience in that way that, that you went in with a certain expectation and then all of a sudden you're like, I was recognised that I did have an ability and said, right, we'll, we'll pull you out and we'll give you support and alternative formats. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, you mentioned the core group was the, the children who stayed At my school, we got uh, letters A, B, C, D and D clearly in the bottom set and A was the top set. But I found it was a mix between myself and some other people who were dyslexic and statemented and just the kids who didn't bother. 
So you had, I had quite a disruptive, particularly in English, education at that point. Was it the same experience or was the core group really focused on just people who were not keeping up because they're dyslexic or yeah. something along those lines? Core group had, but from what my understanding was, I could, you know, I could quite easily be corrected. My, um, you had some sort of educational need to be in that class because you actually had like a designated teacher assistant that went around with you to each, se- each les- lesson. The high school I went to um, wasn't the one I wanted to go to. Okay. <laughs> all my friends were going to all the ones and I wanted to go to Blue Coats in Chester because that's where, you know, a few of my friends were going to. But the parents sat me down and said, look, the place where I would send you to, which is Stanley High, which was my local one, um, for all the problems it had, it had one of the best disability sort of support units for, for students with learning dis- disabilities. So it was the best place for me in that sort of context. Yes, yes. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify that point, but that helps, doesn't it? Because it got you running and started, and then they realised, hang on, you can actually keep up with the children in the other point. So they tweaked the learning style to help you with dyslexia differently by having you removed. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, as you say, in terms of dynamics in the classroom, I'm an old soul, so I can make references to all programmes because... <laughs> My parents used to insist on me watching things like Granada Plus and Granada Gold and stuff. So oh, the 70th program called Please Sir. Yes. Yeah. My, my class was 5C. Okay. So although they were a top set, you know, they, they were the class that had clay fights in art and dude <laughs> fights in the dining hall and, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, the poor form tutor, she, she wouldn't be able to go through the staff room without being called out at some point about somebody who was being sent to isolation or half a class had decided to hide from the teacher whilst they left the room and stuff like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's not, not uh, uh, it sort of seemed funny at the time, but probably not the best long term for getting a decent education. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> so, what sort of support were you given? Apart from you already mentioned being uh, taken out of class and having support that way, were you giving anything extra with like assistive technology or any of that kind of support at school? The the only the only sort of assistive thing I had was a dictaphone. Oh yes, to record my my homework because um, there was a couple oh. of situations when I came home and I thought I'd done the homework that I'd been asked for, and it turned out that what I'd written down in my planner was not the other homework that had been asked. I'd done something, but it wasn't. <laughs> ah. So my ability to record it and put it down was, was a bit of an issue. Right. The, the only issue with having that dictaphone was my class were convinced I was recording their activities and I was reporting back to teachers. Yes, I <laughs> I was about to ask that question. Yeah, I, I can um, see it not making you popular. No, I mean, I was... I, mean, I um, talking about this with a, a friend the other, the other week. At, at school, you know... To be called a SWAT is one thing, but to know, be known as the SWAT, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, was a bit of an issue sometimes. But <laughs> it, it, I mean, it worked for me in that respect. And sometimes I used to play along with it and say, "Yeah, I'm recording you, and I'm reporting everything back to the teacher." So that. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I could see that. It's. Um... It's a tricky thing bringing recording devices out in the middle of lessons. Yeah. Yeah. So you obviously then finished school. Did you go to university straight away or was there a break before you ended up going to your first of many degrees? (laughs) No, no, I went straight away. Um, So what they, I mean, I don't know if you had a similar experience, but at the end of each major sort of key stage, we have what was called a transferal review or end of status review. Oh, I think probably it's something um, similar. So when I got to end of my GCSEs, I had this transfer review. And that's when I had this extra sit-down chat with the careers officer and they said, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to do, do a degree in history, which of course, academically is not the most, not the easiest subject. Someone who's got this like six, there's a lot of reading and, and things involved. And that was when they said, have you considered a trade? As I say, nothing against it, but it's just not, it's not me. That's not how I, I work. Um, I can be creative, you know. I'm, one, of my, one of my hobbies is 
cross stitch hand embroidery and stuff like that but I think there was that sort of also the, the careers officer at the time was possibly nearing retirement age so might have had slightly more antiquated views on what people could do yeah um and I, if anything, that guy galvanised me in terms of, no, I'm going to go and do what I want. It did put me down at one point, but I had an amazing head of sixth form who was also my GCSE who technology teacher at the time and my history teacher. They were both fabulous. Oh, good. And the, the history teacher was the one that went out and said, look, there are colleges and universities that will take you on no matter what. You need to go and look into X, Y, and Z to do that. So um, so they were they were great um, source of support and inspiration in that way. They were really, really understanding and getting me through. So, um, yeah, so I went on to do my, my BA in History and Heritage Management. Um, that was at Chester. But basically, I stayed at home for my degree. I didn't move out anywhere. So I um, stayed with my parents. But that worked for me in terms of being able to focus on studies and, and things like that. So. We were quite lucky in that at the time. So when I went to Chester, it was what was referred to as an accredited college. So it was actually a university of Liverpool degree I have. So accredited through that. Um, and it was only when I was at Chester, I think 2005, we got our own university status there. But at the time, my school had a sort of like a link up agreement with the college, which was if you got basic grades, you get articulation onto the um, the program that you wanted. Okay, yeah, yeah, that was quite helpful in that way as well. So, yes, yeah, so it was um, it was it was a sort of a happy set of circumstances that I managed to get onto that course. But if you looked at my A level results, <laughs> I was not. <laughs> oh, I see. So, did you just about get enough UCAS yeah. points? Right. Yeah, just about. Yeah, and. Um, because uh, it's um, so my my A levels are in English, sociology, and geography, mm-hmm. and they were all E's. Oh, okay. because I can't do exams, coursework, right? Fabulous. I mean, okay. coursework. I think I was getting B's and things like that. So I was I was okay, but in exams I go to pieces. I can't cope. I had an A, B, C in IT, and I got a C in that. So is that? Do you go to pieces even with all the extra time and your own room yeah. and all yeah. the stuff that you get put in place for being dyslexic? Uh, just, yeah, okay. memory recall. Uh, if anything, it's, it's probably more of like a, an anxiety thing. Um, so my key to success when I got onto my degree was I, I navigated my course and modules through interest, but also I looked at what is the assessment profile <laughs> for this module. And if there was a way to avoid an exam, I avoided it. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. Basically. <laughs> yeah, very, very good planning to know your weakness and then tailor the course to not highlight it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, some people, you know, my, my brother mm-hmm. thrives. He, he loves exams. He rather doing exams than coursework. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but to me, that, that, that can, you know, you've got, Far from the truth, I just couldn't stand doing exams. It's just something I can't deal with in that sort of pressured environment. My memory recall is just not, is not there. How did you find, because going straight out of sixth form into university, how did you find that experience initially? Because obviously it's a shift in learning style and, and being dyslexic feeds into that. I had a big gap, so it was completely different when I went to university versus school, but you would have just run straight into it. Yeah, I think um, part of that helped in terms of, I had that, continue again, that sort of momentum that kept me going. But there was some navigation of the systems. Again, it all comes down to systems and understanding how systems work. And if you don't, if you don't know how a system works, um, especially some of the things you have to go to if you have got dyslexia it can be a bit of a warren until you, you tap into it. So I'd been sent off from my, my high school with a copy of my statement and everything. And I went in to be told that doesn't count anymore because you need an educational adult edsite report 
because your school one doesn't count. Of and you're course. Like, but this is what's followed me all the way through. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't <laughs> magically grow out of it, do you? <laughs> no. no. And like, what looks so different between last month when I was in high school and, and you know, six weeks later, starting in a, in a, you know, in a uni book. Yeah, so it took a while to get sort of, my tutors were great in terms of they, they supported me straight away because I just, I flagged it up and said, look, you know, I have got these issues. But they, but the getting the machinery cranked in to get your assessment, to get your extra time and everything else. Um, mm-hmm. When I was at uni, another game changer for me was I was able to sit my exams on a computer. Ah, yes, yes. So def- up until that point, all my papers have been handwritten with oh my, my, God. my scroll. Which is not the thing. I I, I don't envy you. I use scribes all the way through my uni because writing it down was, yeah. Yeah. Um, So when I got to, so um, I think my my first term of exams, I only had about, I only had to sit two or two, I think it was. But after that, all my exams I managed to draw on a PC. So they were able to, it was a bit more understandable in terms of what I was writing within that context as well. So, yeah, so it was, it wasn't ideal, but, and it took a while for things to get into place, but once they were in place, it was, it was great. You know, having, I was from back in the day when you had the, the DSA, you didn't get given a laptop, you got given a home PC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yes. Because <laughs> laptops were too expensive back then, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, um, my PC was upstairs in my bedroom with it, um, and I think at the time, you did get an allowance, I don't think you do anymore, but I got an allowance for broadband and stuff like that as well, to that you could claim on. I don't know if they, they still did that. But... Oh, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I left uni, but I seem to remember yeah. that being a thing earlier on and then it wasn't. Then it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a review. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, yeah, so it was... Um, getting in place was, was a bit of a, a slog, but once it was in place, it was, it was fine. And I, I think the difficulty is because you're not prepped to that level, although they, they give you bits of information... You don't fully understand that you go into a context where you are being treated as an adult, but to try and negotiate those things also for yourself was a bit of a yeah warrant. Yes, times. yes, I can imagine. Um, it, it can be slightly overwhelming initially, can't? It? Particularly when you've got the extra curve all of them going. Well, you now need an adult assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. So, did you <laughs> resit the ed psych assessment then at that point as a? What would you be, 19, 19 year old? Eight, yeah, yeah. So uh, I would have been 19. Because I'm the one of the oldest in my, in my school group, but 30s in September. So I think it was 19 by the time I saw her. Okay. And um, How did you yeah, find uh, the assessment? Because, like myself, I don't remember taking the assessment as a six year old, but I remember taking it in my 20s to go to university. So you would have actually been an adult, know what the hell was going on the second time around. Yeah, How did I you mean, find it's it? Strange. It's strange because. I remember some of the activities they were still doing from when, because I remember being given when I was like that six-year-old being given a set of blocks to sort of put into a sequence order and things and yes, thinking, yeah. what the hell? It's <laughs> 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 got to do with me learning, but but yeah, um, I mean, it, it was like it was, if I, I mean, every year when you're at school, they they, they constantly give you that was at sixty or one hundred word spelling test to see how much further you got on with your spellings and thing. And it was like, <sighs> and it and it's strange because I, I look back now and I think, and it's only recently I've really understood that although the reading and the writing and the spelling is an issue, one of my biggest issues is processing in memory. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I think you, you, you sort of get, I will have, for me, you got brought up in school with this more of a, it's spelling, reading and writing that's an issue. Yes. And not okay. necessarily understanding that's a processing thing behind that that can cause all sorts of issues as well. Yes. Yeah, it's very much dyslexia, the spelling difficulty, but for some people it isn't. And for some people, the processing thing is more of a problem. Like why somebody asks you a question, you know, and then you'll yeah. come up with the answer, a bit of a long pause, or like, I've worked with colleagues who are like that, and it's that their their experience of dyslexia is completely different to mine because theirs is the processing side of it. So, so walk me through. You obviously took your bachelor's, and then your first two masters with the University of Chester as well. 
Uh, my first, yeah, so I did it, and then what happened was I got an MA uh, military history. Um, and I did that at the same time as my MLIT in museum studies with St. Andrews. So what had happened was I'd applied for the St. Andrews course. Um, so that, so the course that I got was, it would say, it's one of only about half a dozen that they run, which is actually distance learning. Mm. Everything else you have to, mm. I still have to go for residential weeks. Yes. Yes. To study in depth study um, sessions and things. But um, so I'd applied for it and not heard anything back. And I thought, stupid Ian, why did you bother? <laughs> <laughs> what led you to tr- think to apply for St. Andrews? Because that's quite a prestigious institution. It was, I, at the time, again, it was a similar situation of um, my parents basically said, we, we want to support you with your, your degrees and things and avoid um, as much student debt as possible. Mm-hmm. So the option was stay at home to allow your brother and sister to go. <laughs> not that they ever did. Not that I hold that against them in <laughs> any way whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> they hear this now, they'll be like, oh, we still, it's a big, big joke because they say the Shrine of Ian's still on the wall of all my graduation photographs. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I saw the course and how it was broken down into modules and sections, and I thought, give it a go i'll apply for it but i hadn't heard anything back and i thought well i haven't gone on to that so what do i do next and um, by that point i was a member of staff at the university as well so i got a staff discount on tuition fees i've always liked military history and i thought i'll do military history it's great so i started that i was actually on that program and started it and then i think it got to about november and then next minute, this acceptance letter came through from St. Andrews, and I was like, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and that call started in the January, that would have been 2008. And I went to, I remember going to one of Houston saying, what do I do? And they said, well, go part-time. You know, do a couple of modules, you know, because the way the, the, uh, the military history course worked they had, you had a set of modules that ran up to Christmas. And then after Christmas, you did a six or seven week in depth module on a particular aerial period. And you did two or, th- two or three of those before you went on to your dissertation. So they said, just stretch it out. You should be able to, to manage it. So that's what I did. So like a bit of a maniac, I, I ended up doing those two at the same time. <laughs> but the focus. But by that point, though, I'd, I'd broken the back of the of the core modules that I needed to do from the MA in history. So, the what was sort of waiting after that were just the optional ones. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah. It's so I was able just to pick up like a module a year okay. in that way. That's quite a tricky thing to juggle, isn't it? Because I imagine St Andrews push you quite hard for what they want. They do, but the the course that we had, it had such a, the phrase that gets banded around now in, in the world of academia is called authentic assessment. But what that code is for is basically any assessments you, you do are related to the workplace and the activities that you're doing. So because my degree was in museum studies, you know, you one of your assessments was write a museum exhibition label for X item write a catalogue entry for X. You know, it was, a, it was a portfolio of work that you put together. There was a few essays and things in there as well, but there was a more practical element um, on that. I mean, two of the big projects we had to do, which were um, which were actual real-life projects, you had to... So you had to do one that was called an interpretation project. So that was like either an exhibition or a, an education workshop. And the other one was to do a collection management. So you had to plan a project and deliver it and then do a write-up on it. So there's a lot of practical sort of emphasis on it in that way. So but yeah, it was it was it was a, it was an in-depth and interesting course. Made some amazing friends and contacts up there. Got married up there as well. You no. Know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. You can, can only be an alumna, an alumnus of uh, you can get married there if you're an alumnus or you live in the in the in the area. So so I managed to get a bit of a, 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 a what to call it a, a spatula with that one. But it was it was a good course though. It was very and 
I I went into it with a bit of trepidation of well, how are they going to feel about having a dyslexic on the course. And then when I found out I wasn't the only one on the course with dyslexia from the part-time set, there was a bit of a community sort of thing that we had then that we sort of, you know, swap things about and experiences and things and stuff as well. So yeah, that's quite good. How did you find St. Andrews with dyslexia support versus your experience at Chester? The interesting thing with St. Andrews was, I mean, um, at Chester, I, I, every assignment I submitted, I had a nice little sticker. Yep, I remember. That said, <laughs> <laughs> I'm special, consider me special. <laughs> <laughs> Strange enough, they, 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 they did not regard that. You didn't have any special little stickers or things in St. Andrews. You just submitted your work. And I think there was technically a 5% gradient in your mark, and it was for spelling and grammar and stuff, which never really was uh, applicable for me, really. But the tutors were always mindful that I had those sort of difficulties in that, that respect. But, I mean, I was getting... The strange thing is, I mean, most of the universities mark out of 100, or St. Andrews do it out of 20, well, they used to. Okay. It's a, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, and uh, a first was 16.5 or above. And a lot of my marks were peppered 15. I did get a few above the 16.5, but I didn't get um, an overall. So I, I was, I think I was from like points, point 0.5 or point 0.8 of a mark of an overall distinction, which was a bit gutting. It hurts. Yeah. But, <laughs> In St. Andrews, you can, you can graduate with distinction in coursework, distinction in dissertation, or distinction overall. Uh-huh. Okay. So I graduated with a distinction in my dissertation. So I did get part of a distinction in there, just, just not an overall one. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned about the stickers or reports. I used to use them when I was at uni. Until third year, when we all got a letter home, and they had reviewed it and decided the assisted technology had matured to the point where they felt the stickers weren't necessary, so we weren't allowed to have them anymore. Um, oh, I had a load spare, so they still got used until I ran out. But uh, <laughs> it's really interesting at like by, well, at that being 2012, 2013, mm. by that point, that they, they believed that the assistive tech was fine by that point to get the spelling grammar to where it needed to be. I think by the time I got onto my MA um, in Chester, we, we'd gone from a sticker to a preface sheet that was called an IAF. Right. Okay. It was an an, um, an individual assessment feedback form, and it would basically say, "Ian has got this condition, these issues. Be mindful of them when you're marking work." And in all fairness, every single tutor they always—I <laughs> don't know if it was like a get out clause, but they would always start off their feedback with, "We have noted Ian's IAF, and you know we will give guidance in the following areas," sort of thing, but. <laughs> I think there's this over reliance on saying, "Oh, well, the assistive technology is there and are there now to, to solve all their problems." I'm sorry, <laughs> I have sent emails to people apologising for incontinence, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> rather than inconvenience. Inconvenience, inconvenience because yeah. I just can't. You know, <laughs> you write things out, but. Things do slip through, so they do, they do. And <laughs> that that is a problem, isn't it? Um, the assistive tech is there, and it's getting better and better all the time, and it's becoming, it's getting there, but you, it stuff does slip through, and it also depends on how your dyslexia manifests itself as well. As we spoke about earlier that. Sometimes it, that's not quite the right thing for it, and maybe you do need a little bit more help with the report writing stuff. Like I remember getting a proofreading service my dissertation, <laughs> but I didn't use it until my uh, lecturer had read it through. You know, you get like a, a lecture that helps you with your dissertation, and he's like, "Oh my god, what is all this? Like your work's not normal." I'm like, no, "I'm dyslexic. This is what it looks like before it gets put through any filters." <laughs> but I can't. Yeah spend half the time proofreading every draft sent to you because I won't be able to finish the degree because it would take me too long. And it, it kind of, it took a little while, but then, yeah, you send out to the professional service and that, that, that gets it to where it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I think there has been a couple of occasions when I've sent things off. And um, I mean, I had a lot of colleagues and friends that were also sort of like sounding boards and things. And so you can just look over that form and they'll come back. And, and you know, I had um, one, well, one one lady who, who, who assisted me a lot and it was uh, Dr. Lisa Peters. She was the librarian. And she she was amazing. Some of, some of the work I had, and she was she would come back and there'd be like a, a sort of a box around a section. It's like, what are you going on about there? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me look at that again. I know what I've written. Well, I think I know what I've written. Yeah. And then when you read it back, you're thinking that's not what I've written at all. <laughs> so um, and and there was a there's another lady who was I mean the very I mean, I mean a very sort of strange incestuous situation in one respect that when I first started working as a learning resources assistant we had a um, I had a weekend supervisor who was above me who managed me and um she is SPL, she is specific learning difficulty support designate for the library and she's specializes in all that sort of that sort of support and I'm now her manager which is weird because she's like a second mother to a certain extent <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah and and every now and again there, there will be the odd email saying can you just glance your eye over that and then you know we'll come back with a, a little yellow highlight of i'm not sure what you mean by this bit here and I'm like, yeah i'm not explaining myself with that bit but they but yeah so so it was a mix of all sorts of support mechanisms and mm-hmm. bringing friends and you know, say i think mean, you said a number of your other um podcast we we find ways of getting around the system <laughs> and finding ways to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. navigate our way through so yeah luckily being creative and problem solving <laughs> you kind of use all of that skill set to sometimes navigate the system so as you've alluded to you now obviously now work in chester uni's library as a librarian did you do like a marathon uni stint and then start working, or was it a bit of a splice between the two? <laughs> no, I mean, all my master. Actually, I started working at the uni as a weekend assistant in my second year of my degree, and then all my masters were part time. Ah, okay, cool, cool. And I worked throughout that. So, I mean, when I was, so when I did my my undergrad, I had two jobs on the go. Um, so I, I, I worked for a. A large scale bingo provider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might begin with the letter M. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I did I did about four years there. And, um didn't really do the calling. I was I was more in the sort of the cash office and signed a bit in treasury and paying out money and you know, winnings and and things, which was which, I mean, I've always had a bit of an issue with confidence. And if you ever want a, a way to try and solve that issue, get yourself a job in a bingo hall. That's one way to do it. Absolutely. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> you'll soon learn that you can't really be unconfident in a bingo hall. Especially oh. when, you know, you're know you checking a claim for £30,000 with a microphone with the rest of the country dialing it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can could, I could see where you're going with that. <laughs> So I had that sort of on the on the go at the same time as working as a part time um, library assistant, and then when I, when I got onto the uh, St Andrews Hospital, something got to give. So so I, I said goodbye to the bingo job and kept on with the, the library assistant, and then I got um, sort of promoted to supervisor, weekend supervisor, and assistant librarian. Um, did that for a few years, and then um, got on to subject librarian, and now site librarian. So it's been a natural progression. The issue was when I did my my museums degree. By the time I finished it, we said hello to Mister Credit Crunch. <laughs> yes, oh dear. And that's when all the all the money and funding got pulled for the museums. Mm. So, and I am not someone who wants to move down to London. I'm not a big <laughs> no, city fair. person. Chester's a nice little controlled space. St Andrews is even smaller. Yes, which is me down to the ground. <laughs> so yeah, so. A lot of my, I still do stuff in museums. So I'm, a, I'm the volunteer curator for a museum in the university. So we've got a museum of health and medicine. Okay, yes. Um, called the, the Riverside Museum. So I volunteer with my, I still keep my hand in that way with my curatorial stuff. That's a, an interesting experience because a lot of our volunteers are retired practitioners. So you hear all the stories, you know, it's, 
what it used to be like to be a nurse in the 1960s. And yeah, so it's, um, it's a nice, nice sort of difference to, to, to the day job is the library stuff. But yeah, it can, it can be interesting, especially when you're in your meetings or you're with students. And every now and again, it will come up the sale, but I'm just like, and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're talking to a dyslexic. Okay. What's, what's the issue sort of thing? Yeah. Um, and the look on the faces sometimes, but you're a librarian, you work with books. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could, I could see the confusion. Um, how do you find that? Like, how does dyslexia work as a librarian? Well, I mean, it's interesting because it depends on who you talk to. And if you, if you ask them, what does a librarian do? They will say to you straight away, issuing books and stamping books nine times out of ten and cataloging and classifying. Don't forget collecting um, book fines. <laughs> <laughs> Saying that, we've actually abolished ours now in Chester pretty much, so like, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, no, um, <laughs> no, <you do. laughs> but, but yeah, so there, there's all of that sort of perception of what you're doing, but um, the, the faculty I support to business, like uh, business faculty. So a lot of it now is digital searching. It's it's Boolean search logics and how to actually search, search things effectively on databases or on, you know, although I know it pains me to say as, as a librarian, but if you do want to Google something, I can show you how to use Google effectively rather than just typing in a few search, search words and hoping for the best. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, and it's amazing the amount of times we do sessions and things and they'll say, oh, that's how you do that. Or, oh, that's how you get that information. <laughs> and so little light bulbs go off in the sessions that I deliver. So I find that quite funny as well. But it it is interesting because you do get some people's reactions of say, what are you doing then in a library if you're just like, things like well, it's because I am doesn't mean I haven't got the, the skill set to to be able to to support it i mean i think part of the other part of the, the thing with the library work was i i was a school librarian throughout wow. my school career okay so i was able to navigate resources pretty effectively from the get-go i understand it understood how the dewey decimal system worked if i was to ever show you how to construct a dewey decimal number and the four volumes of dewey decimal that are out there you pro- your mind will probably just go to mush because the schedules and the rules and the regs that are in it. Some of my staff laugh at me now when I get the, like, oh, it's got the decimal out again. It's like, can you not just design a number that already exists here? <laughs> 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 uh, we're building this section. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, you know, again, it's possibly me sticking those metaphoric two fingers to the c- careers consultant who said, go into a trade job and like, well, no, that's not me. That's not what I want to do. And it, it sort of speaks to my sort of approach is on debt of life with lifelong learning. There's always something new to learn, skill, bit of knowledge, information. And I see that just as much as doing, um, qualifications. And I might have a slight obsession with graduations as well. Um, <laughs> your own or just being at the ceremonies <laughs> just yeah well I, I work at the test of ceremonies um, okay you no know, I get to put a red gown on and, and have a stick and process people around and you know so, oh, so oh nice oh <laughs> uh, yeah yeah you know I, I'm there if there's a bit of if there's a bit of pomp and ceremony going on I, I'm there for it um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then then there was the excitement to discover there is a whole society out there of people that that study this stuff called the Burgon Society. They, you know, I mean, I, you know how people sort of can do those sort of skills of memory maps when they can identify a football strip from the last twenty years. Or yeah, I'll go to you. I can do that. I can do that with academic hoods. Oh. I can look at a hood and say, <laughs> "MA." Liverpool John Laws or MA University of Liverpool. I can pretty much, I'm not saying I can get them all because every now and again there'll be one that comes up and I'm like, 
where's that from? And I go up to go up to the person and say, can you tell me where you graduated from, what you love and degree is, please? So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting one, but I just, yeah, I just love learning. I yeah. So certainly being in the library is a good place for you, really. I, I was initially when you contacted me about coming on here, I was like, librarian? Like, surrounded by books and letters and stuff all day. But now you've explained that the job is not what uh, I think films make us think it is. <laughs> yeah. Do you enjoy books and reading out of books? I'm, I'm curious to know. You, you know what? I, I cannot read for pleasure. So I'm probably going to be one of those people now, but to some librarians are like, <gasps> reading for me has always been a task orientated. It's, it's, you know, either you're reading for study or you're reading for work and it's something that's got to be done. So if I want to relax, for me, Audible mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. my friend. Yes, mine too. So um, that's what I will use to listen to fiction at the moment. So what am I on at the moment? Um, oh, well, I've started going back through the Harry Potters again at the moment. So that's okay. what I'm listening to at the moment. But, um, <laughs> but I'll have the classics on there. So, you know, I love a bit of Jane Austen. <laughs> or, um, which some people would say, why on earth would you read that? Because and it's like, well, if you did read it, you wouldn't understand what on earth was going on, really. <laughs> it's a dyslexic. But when you hear it, it's so much more easier. And it, it's the same with things like Shakespeare. I mean, being able to listen and maybe watch a video or a film production of it. We have great um, theatre productions for Shakespeare in the park in just every year. We have theatre in the park. Okay, yep. Yeah. So we can, so can actually, quite often now, I will get an audio of the play and I'll watch a film of the play. So that when we go to watch live performance, I can understand what's going on and understand <laughs> the plot. Yes, yes. Won't go as far as, you know, lap along with those parts where, you know, there's meant to be a, a subtle joke that everybody else who seems to be in the know will lap along with. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't agree. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully by, the, by that moment the wine's kicked in anyway so like <laughs> <laughs> a bit of lubrication always helps doesn't it yeah so, so you would have had to do a lot of reading for your various history degrees oh well. yeah yeah how did you because you said like reading's not pleasurable to you how did you get around that did you just have to make yourself read did you use YouTube or audio books or what were you using at the time uh, to help with that well, when I was doing my degrees, YouTube wasn't really a thing. No, I suppose not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's it's weird when I think about, you know, it's all the things that are out there now. So I had uh, Read and Write Gold. Yep, yeah. Yeah, they just scan your pages and the pages in, because of course this was before ebooks were really a thing. <laughs> um, yeah. However, even with ebooks now, there's only so much of an automated voice someone can take. <laughs> yes. And yes. This, it, it's quite funny because I can be sat in meetings when we talk about assistive technologies for ebooks for this very reason that we're talking about. And it's like, oh well, we've got, you know, we've got this and that, and we can we can turn them into audio files and the ebook will play it back. And I'm like, have you tried listening to an ebook with that with that voice? Because it is not a pleasurable experience. And don't get me wrong, it's it's a great assistive technology to have. But by that point, I'd learned you had to be strategic yes, in yes. what you were looking at. So even now when we've got students coming through, the amount of students that don't understand what the concept of an index is at the back of the book, I have to do activities now on how to navigate a book. Oh, Because when they get a textbook yeah. or a monograph, they think, I've got to read that cover to cover to understand Oh, no, no. What I need is like, no, you need oh. to just go to a chapter or a specific section and work your way through that. So, and that's how I got through a lot of my history degrees. It was, it was navigating and rather than reading cover to cover, it was being very strategic and I need to read that section to understand, I don't know, this particular area of Norman kingship mm-hmm. or church governance or something like that. So. Yeah, you sort of become. I used to find that that I'd have a 
decent working knowledge of the whole thing, but you become an expert at the bit that you're focused on. And in a report, you become the boffin of that very small area. Because yes. It's not, as you said, reading a book from cover to cover or even by the time I was at uni, sort of later on in life, I like, could use YouTube and stuff to, to get the skim knowledge, but it just takes too long. And it, the thing, I had a big book scanner, you could scan things in and get it to read it to you, but it, that, you are right, the, the voice is very robotic after a while and it's got no inflection. It's not like listening to an audio book at all. Yeah. And it's, it just starts you to will, wash over you. Yeah, you glaze over. It gets yeah. to a point. Um, and that, I mean, I think the other thing I found helpful with that was I would have the audio going and I'd have a, a, a physical print scan. Right, yes. So annotations then became my sort of, yeah. I but, love a colour code. I was about to say multicoloured highlighters, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, colour yeah, code, yeah. yeah. Colour for everything. A, a, a post-it note. Um, <laughs> one of my first ever jobs was in stationary box. I think about three quarters of my wages used to actually go on stationary because I've got, even now, I can't <laughs> really walk past a, a station as well. thinking, oh, pens and Martin's like, sorry, Martin's my other half. Okay. He's like, you do not need... <laughs> any more stationary <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> yeah, but it's great have you seen it yes <laughs> <laughs> I need another purple highlighter no you don't <laughs> so oh. um, so yeah so it's uh, I, it's, again, it's, uh, it's another way of sort of navigating your way around the, the various bits of information and just trying to find ways that, that work for you um I've only sort of come later on in life into the world of mind maps. Oh, yes, yes. And, and, and things. And you got shown them at school. Yes. But I don't think you were ever taught how they could work for I, you. Yeah, I think they were... Sh- my memory, and I might have been jaded and it might have been inspired over them, I got, but I definitely don't remember getting them taught them in a context of sorting a dyslexia brain into... No. Yeah, that can, that, yeah. I mean, I always remember what, one of the things that my history teacher did with me that I used to find really helpful was I would write out or, you know, parts of an essay and literally I would physically cut it. It's the equivalent of cut and paste on a computer now, but that was how I would organize my ideas and things. So I'd do something like that to physically actually cut them out and bring them together to try and bring some sort of order to what, I'd, what I had. But yeah, I think, as you say, sort of mind maps and spider diagrams and things, you got told to do them, but you didn't necessarily understand why you're doing them or the the, the purpose or how you could use them. Yes, um, and how they would specifically as a dyslexic person yeah. help you yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. yeah and I was, so how are you finding that experience now with all the mind mapping? I'm finding things? mind mapping more helpful, especially in meetings and things. Are you software or handwriting? Handwriting at the moment, but there again, that's part of me likes okay. to doodle. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And you can be in meetings sometimes and you're like, you know, on a very on a, on a, an agenda item for maybe 15, 20 minutes and you're thinking, okay, where, where are we up to with this now? We've been around the houses several times. What's the decision? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I think the other thing also is, is, Especially in the professional context, has been, I should say, knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, I will not put my hand up now for minutes in meetings. No. There was a time I felt like I had an onus because everybody else had let it go. And I'm like, no, that, that is not my skill set. <laughs> no, um, f- fair point. I, I did it yep. once a couple of months back because nobody else would. And the meeting had been recorded. And I spent spending nearly half a day trying to come up with a set of mean minutes because I basically we re- we sat through the meeting again. It just didn't. <laughs> oh my word! Yeah, that, that's that's a lot yeah. of extra. And that, 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 that's that yeah. point, I was like, no, I need to just say at that point. That's not me. And, and somebody yeah. else needs to to to, to to lead on that one. So yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely gets gets tricky. I I used to find that I couldn't write and listen at the same time. So <laughs> you're trying to minute a meeting that you're not half not listening to because your brain's working on operating. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone then being expected to make a contribution, <laughs> <laughs> or all of a sudden discover, discovering how many actions have I actually been assigned here. 
<laughs> That's gone under the radar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Minute Taker 101, always just sign an action to other people. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is interesting. Minutes is a funny thing, isn't it? And I've, I've come up with strategies over the, over the years to remember, particularly if it's my meeting that I'm in control of it, slow people down and keep it, keep it brief and all that kind of things. But it's a tricky one to keep going as a dyslexic person in a busy meeting sometimes. So that brings me really quite nicely round to um, sort of near the end of the episode. And I want to ask you some rapid fire questions. I have three of them. They don't need quick answers from you, but I thought we'd give these a go. So the first question is, what prejudice did you have about dyslexia that's now been proven wrong? That you, that if you got dyslexia, you can't succeed in an academic environment. Yes, you've certainly proven that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> you most, will do it. Most definitely. Yeah, I, I think, and it's it's strange how many people you come up, even now when I come across academics who have got PhDs, and like, ah, you know, and they only got diagnosed whilst doing a PhD. You know, they, they struggled all the way to that point and thought it was them. Well, yeah. So, yeah, I think... I'm very much one of these people that I don't like having a box assigned and then that's it, that's your box sort of thing. If you feel that there's something you really, really want to do, mm. give it a go. Yes, most definitely. Yeah, that don't let it get in the way at all because there are lots of people with degrees who have dyslexia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, second question is, if an A didn't come down, how would you describe dyslexia to them? I would say... It's a mix of issues with reading, writing, and spelling, and processing. That's the biggest sort of enlightenment for me. I've gone through a lot of my life thinking it was just the reading, the writing, and not realizing actually there's a bit of a processing element to it as well. And I think that's the bit that needs to be articulated more to students when they are diagnosed, to be quite honest, um, because I don't think there's enough done around that. There's a lot of treating some of the symptoms, that's the best way to describe it, yeah. rather than yep. going into depth. Um, and I think, yeah, that's the, one of the biggest components of that is that processing sort of side of it. Yeah, no, you, you're totally right. And she probably does need a little bit more light on it um, and how tools and strategies can help you with processing and processing speed. And the final question of the podcast and seeing is the name of the podcast is the Dyslexia Life Hack Show. What is your favourite Dyslexia Life Hack? I would say, for me, the joyous world of Pomodoro, is it? <laughs> I don't know if you the Pomodoro technique. So, right, so you can get yourself into a task and you can find yourself an hour into the task and still not make much of a dent in it one way or another. So there's this technique out there where you, you put yourself a time of the 25 minutes and you give yourself that box of time to do a specific thing. And after that 25 minutes, you have a five-minute break. And then you set another time, you do another task. So rather than losing, say, half an hour, half a day on something, that because you're getting a bit overwhelmed um, with what needs to be done, having that list and that time blocking yeah. can really help organise your workflows. No, I really like that. that, that yeah, that's quite quite cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I like the and idea. I think the other thing also is it's getting up from away from the from the the desk mm-hmm. um, and away from the you know from that sort of that screen fatigue um, thing because otherwise you'll find yourself. I mean, well, I I have found myself just sat at the computer for ages and not actually having a break. So yeah. having that physical time, you can actually get apps, Pomodoro apps and things, but um, and you can pay for things if you really really want to be that vested invested in it. But equally. You set a timer on your old iPhone, mm-hmm. twenty-five minute timer. Then, um, but the actual idea came from a chap who did it, and he actually actually had a tomato cooking timer. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, and I think, I think it's Italian. You bought tomato pomodoros, and I don't know. No idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think pomodoro is is Italian for tomato, and he literally used to have this timer that you put on for twenty-five minutes, and when it binged. You would go off and, and have a break and things. So yeah, so so try and divide your time up to to t- sort of work through tasks and things. And my other hack would be if you've got anything, 
a highlighter, colour pen, and post-it notes will go a long, long way to organising your thoughts. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. They, they really do have a decent system. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Ian, for taking the time to come and talk to me. It's been really, really interesting hearing your journey, and it's certainly a different one to some of the guests I've had on before. Is there anything you'd like to add before we sign off? Well, I think that's, that's everything I've got. I'll say, I think you just follow your, your interests and your dreams and don't be afraid to ask for help. I think there's, there's the, you can, you can get sort of this self complex if you've been through school that you don't want to be seen asking for help or you've seen it as a weakness, but the help's there to be accessed. You've just got to ask for it. Yes. Yeah. We all can't do everything on our own. So yeah, definitely getting some help is really important and you'll find it will unlock things you didn't even know you could unlock. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen and I will see you guys in the next episode. Goodbye for now. Bye.